In a week which hasn't exactly been short of politics, what better way to head into the weekend uh, than with a cheeky wee by-election? I'm Neil Patterson, and on this edition of the Sky News Daily, uh, well, we're going to be looking in depth at that pretty remarkable Labour victory in the Scottish seat of Rutherglen and Hamilton West. Now, as always, it is important to say that by-elections are but litmus tests, that you cannot directly extrapolate out what will happen at a general election from a single result. That said... That's no doubt exactly what we're going to be doing with our two guests. Conor Gillis is our Scotland correspondent and Professor Michael Thrasher, our elections supremo. Chaps, great to have you both on. But Conor, to, to you first, before we get into the result, remind us exactly what led to this by-election. So this has been a long-running saga triggered by the former SNP MP, Margaret Ferrier, uh, the woman who travelled to London uh, and then, knowing she had coronavirus, uh, travelled back on a train to Glasgow, toured around various places. She ended up in the courts over that uh, and faced criminal sanctions as a result um, of what she ended up doing. That then triggered a uh, petition, recall petition, within the House of Commons, which essentially led to her being ousted. More than 10,000 people here in the constituents signed that petition, saying uh, she should no longer represent them in this part of the world. Uh, and here we are today with Labour taking victory. Not necessarily the most unexpected of results, but a, a great result for Scottish Labour. No other way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, for many years, uh, Scottish Labour has been in the doldrums of uh, politics north of the border, and that all stems back primarily to the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. Uh, Labour was heavily criticised and punished at the polls for teaming up with the Conservatives as part of a Better Together campaign, and ultimately the Better Together campaign uh, won the day Scotland voted to stay part of the UK. But Labour has has paid a heavy price in the years uh, following that and has had uh, one MP north of the border until very recently. The party has had a bit of momentum throughout the course of this uh, campaign. They've been capitalising clearly on that police investigation uh, that the SNP is mired in, the arrest of the former leader, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, and her release without charge, the same uh, cycle of events for her husband, Peter Murrow, uh, and clearly that bitter and bruising contest fought uh, neck and neck between Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes. Labour, I think privately, have been loving every minute of this and have been pounding the pavements here in the central belt of Scotland in this constituency, hoping to make gains. And privately, uh, going in to the final hours of this count last night and culminating in the vote, they were potentially looking at between 7 and 10% of a swing away from the SNP towards them, the Labour Party. But ultimately, it was a whopping 20% uh, swing, which even took them by surprise. And, and we're going to crunch those numbers a little bit with Michael in just a second. But in terms of what was being said on the doorstep, was it anything more than pointing fingers at Margaret Ferrer, making accusations about the SNP leadership? Or was, was there any policy, any policy debate going on? I think the stars aligned for uh, Labour. They have taken advantage of the chaos uh, unfolding in Westminster around Partygate, uh, around recent developments um, when it comes to the Conservatives and the Prime Minister, uh, Rishi Sunak. But this boiled down to local issues, and particularly the behaviour of Margaret Ferrier, the criminal behaviour of Margaret Ferrier, and they took the party line that this is an area that has been let down by two governments, in Edinburgh and at London, and it was time for a fresh start. And that feeds in to this uh, sense that Labour suggests it's going to bring about fresh change and has the momentum behind it to win in the next general election. And this was seen as a key test of that matter mantra of that hope uh, going into the votes next year and clearly uh, they have won and they have won big. So Michael looking at the numbers what do you make of it what were your first impressions when you saw that result last night? My first impression was wow <laughs> um, I, I was I was kind of prepared for a swing of around about 10 percent which would give Labour an additional um, 15 seats 
on a on a simple swing measure across um, Scotland, and um, fifteen seats would would be quite quite nice. Uh, but as you said at the beginning, it's a by election. When I saw a twenty percent swing, however, that's a game changer, uh, and it, it can't simply be brushed aside in terms of well, it's only a by election. The general election is going to be completely different. Um, I don't think it would be completely different. And um, I think that, the, you know, what, the explanation, I think, that the SNP wanted to give was that it was all to do with low turnout. They struggled to get um, their vote out. And indeed, it was the it was the second lowest turnout in a post-war by-election where the seat has changed hands. You'd expect uh, electors to turn out where it's quite clearly uh, the seat's at stake. Um, and they didn't. And probably the, the, the most likely explanation for that is the SNP simply couldn't persuade its, its former voters to come out uh, and support it. But I think what Labour also did, and, uh, and it was surprising, is how effectively they squeezed both uh, the Conservative vote, and remember the Conservatives lost their, their deposit in, in this by-election, and also uh, the Liberal Democrat vote to a lesser extent. And um, that suggests to me um, a real problem for the SNP, that if, if Conservative, Liberal Democrat and Labour voters uh, do really want to uh, reduce the stranglehold that the SNP has, uh, both in terms of the Westminster representation that they have, and also the grip on Holland, then the way forward for them might well be to look at the strategic situation in uh, the parliamentary constituency and then vote accordingly. But so a most interesting result. Yeah, but given the fact, Michael, that this seat has flip-flopped, you know, every election that I can remember in the past few years, isn't it entirely likely that when, you know, as in 2019 at the election, when you had a 66.5% turnout, when you see the turnout returning to that, isn't that the point at which, you know, the SNP, t the SNP take their seat again? Well, there's always that uh, issue, isn't there, about, you know, the, the, the by-election turnouts generally are, are lower than uh, they are at the, at, the, um, at, at the general election. So we expect uh, that line in turnout. It's the size of the drop in turnout. Uh, it's virtually half um, compared with the uh, last general election. And we, we need to sort of seek the explanation for that. And my, again, I have no evidence because it's a secret ballot. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't stop people as they came out of the polling station and asked them how they voted last time, how they voted this time, and so on. So it's speculation on my part. But it does suggest to me that um, the SNP has struggled to, to get out the vote. And uh, again, uh, but almost certainly, I, I suspect that there is quite a number of... Um, um, SNP former voters that switched to Labour at this by-election. And that that is, is significant for Labour because it, it needs Scottish representation so badly uh, if it's to stand any chance, in my opinion, of doing well at the next general election. Uh, Connor, what, what have we been hearing from the, the, the leaders of, you know, obviously, not just Scottish Labour, but presumably also from the SNP? Yeah, I think it's been interesting. I was chatting to Keir Starmer just a few minutes ago and he said that the key to the success here was not the chaos uh, around the police stuff involving the SNP or uh, really the chaos around the Conservatives. He is saying that this has been a positive pitch, in his words, because the country has had 16 years of the SNPs, had 13 years of the Conservatives, and it's time for change. But I think there's been really interesting uh, lines coming out of uh, not quite the leadership of the SNP, but the Westminster leadership in Stephen Flynn. He was saying earlier on today that the SNP cannot carry on with business as usual in light of this defeat. Is that a dig at Hamza Youssef? What story does that tell us in terms of where the SNP picks up the pieces and tries to go ahead and turn its fortunes around for what will be a major year next year. Is he pivoting himself uh, to a leadership position potentially in the future? He has always been seen 
as a likely candidate for that. He made the switch uh, in the Commons, ousting, or, you know, not quite ousting, but certainly putting pressure on Ian Blackford to resign uh, earlier on this year. Um, so will there be manoeuvring? Will this be a time to knock heads? This, of course, let's remember, was the first big electoral test for Hamza Youssef, um, following on from his success in the internal election within the SNP an election that the SNP itself didn't want to have. They'd enjoyed success under Nicola Sturgeon. They'd won every election in Scotland since she took power more than 3,000 days ago. So this is uncharted territory for the SNP when it comes to recent electoral uh, fortunes. They're not used to losing, uh, and that will be hurting the leadership, and it will be forcing many within senior ranks of the party to question the strategy, to question the independence positioning. And clearly they are meeting in Aberdeen for their conference next week. And this will dominate the conversation. Uh, Michael, I mean, as you've, as you've alluded to, the Tory candidate did indeed lose their deposit you know, in the week of the Conservative Party conference, no less. And absent that 20% swing, we may well have been talking about that. But let's talk about the swing. I mean, where in Scotland now looks... Well, where in Scotland do Labour now focus their resources for the next general election? Where now looks weak for the SNP? Well, everywhere <laughs> on, this level, on this level of swing, Neil. It's, it's a question of um, how you scale it back for a general election. And, um, and that's, that's tricky because um, in recent general elections, the, 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 the rhythm of the general election has been different in Scotland to elsewhere uh, in England and Wales, for example. So it's very difficult to kind of um, say with any degree of certainty, but certainly they, uh, the SNP rather has to be vulnerable in the urban uh, central belt. Uh, there's no question that that's where uh, it built its strength up at the expense of labor uh, in 2000. Um, and that's where it really is um, well uh, embedded in terms of its, um, its its electoral position. Labour couldn't have hoped for a better by-election than Rother Glen. It was, the I think, the fourth um, most marginal SNP seat in, in terms of Labour's target list. So it was a relatively easy target uh, for them to succeed in. But it's, it's I keep going back to this size of Labour's vote went up 24 points. Right. And that's an incredible amount. Uh, and it mirrors some of the kind of performances that Labour has been doing uh, in recent parliamentary elections uh, in England, for example. And uh, for the SNP now, it needs to sort of take stock. And uh, th the problem it's going to have, I think, is in terms of um, stopping uh, internal squabbling within the party. And moreover, as if as and when the recent or future polling figures are bad for the SNP in terms of um, Westminster voting intention, Holyrood voting intention, or comments on the leadership, then there is a possibility that it can uh, slide away uh, from power, away from electoral success uh, rather quickly. Uh, Michael Connor, pause there. We are just going to take a break after it. We will be looking once again at the bigger picture when it comes to Scottish politics, whether the SNP is this a point at which Scottish Labour return. We'll be back in a sec. Welcome back. Our Scotland correspondent, Conor Gillis, and our elections analyst, uh, Michael Thrasher, still here talking about last night's Rutherland by-election. And, and, and to you first, Conor. Um, Michael Shanks, the winning candidate, winning Labour candidate, left the party, in fact, under Je when it was uh, being led by Jeremy Corbyn, now back within the fold. I'm just wondering about the state of Scottish Labour right now. You know, once derided from London as the branch office, uh, derided by the SNP for a lack of political, a lack of parliamentary representation for a number of years. I mean, has Anna Sarwar turned things round? I think there is the beginning of change uh, and a change in fortunes uh, for Labour who've been humiliated at the ballot box at every contest going in the last couple of years. And at that rally uh, that I was at just a few minutes ago, there was a real sense of energy and something that we haven't witnessed from the Labour Party north of the border 
for so long, that is the scene that we would have been witnessing at an SNP contest. It's really interesting, actually. I'm just um, seeing a message here from a colleague who works for the Times newspaper, uh, and Kieran Andrews is suggesting that the first sign of pressure on Hamza Youssef uh, is mounting a senior source telling him within the SNP, if Hamza stays as leader, then we, f we face annihilation in 2026, which is the next Scottish Parliament elections. And that is the laser focus. How do the SNP continue with the success that they have enjoyed in the Scottish Parliament elections, where they have turned around every First Minister uh, in the last 30, uh, 16 years or so? Will there now be a fear that Labour is gaining momentum, the issue of the Constitution, the issue of independence is entering the back burner stage and there is fatigue over that and could Labour switch that once and for all with Anna Sarwar suggesting as he has done for quite some time that he could be Scotland's next First Minister. Well that will focus minds and this result in this by-election will do just that. That will be the catalyst for having a root and branch look at everything the SNP is doing and trying to achieve at the moment. I mean, Michael, what is your best guess as to what is going on with what, you know, some of those who voted yesterday for the Labour candidate clearly would have been yes voters. Why are they perhaps turning to Labour, do you think? I mean, there is obviously the cost of living crisis ongoing. There are issues with public services in Scotland. There's, there's fatigue. There is fatigue with a government that has been in place for so long and, and hasn't delivered on the, constitutional, on the constitutional settlement. I mean, so why are these, these yes voters prioritising a vote in this direction uh, rather than one for, you know, independence? This is a fascinating um, aspect, I think, of recent Scottish polling that, um, you know, the, the, the figures that relate to the desire for independence and another referendum are more or less... Uh, stable. Uh, and yet at the same time, support for the SNP has been in decline. And we've certainly seen in the case of uh, the Ruther Glen by-election, electoral, real electoral support uh, is, is in decline. So that's a curiosity. And it's as though voters have kind of uh, perhaps making a judgment that although they're in favour of independence, it's unlikely in the near future that there will be a second referendum and therefore they might well be turning to uh, a rather more forensic examination first of all of the SNP performance in power at Holyrood and secondly taking a wider perspective about um, what are the prospects for the next general election um, if, if, if it becomes a choice about a Conservative or Labour government most of these uh, voters will definitely opt for a uh, Labour government in, given that choice, and therefore they might start to think, and given uh, that people like me will tell them how important it is for Labour to win Indeed. Scotland, they might they might start thinking, well, OK, um, maybe we, we can, um, at this next general election, maybe we can think again about backing Labour, because it looks as though they might be the largest party, maybe uh, an overall majority and therefore it's as well that we align ourselves with the the, the way in which the the wind blows in terms of the uh, uh, UK government and so that's a that's a critical position uh, for Labour. Uh, Connor you, I mean you mentioned just before we took the break you know you mentioned the dissent that we are seeing you know from amongst others you know SNP's leader in Westminster have you ever known the SNP in the past few years to have this level of public dissent. And as Michael's been saying, there, there, is a route, there is a roadmap for Labour to get a majority at the next general election. And frankly, if the SNP are fighting amongst themselves, it makes it an awful lot easier. I think um, one of the biggest uh, focus points, to just put this all in perspective, this was supposed to be the month in a couple of weeks' time that this time last year, Nicola Sturgeon, the then First Minister, was suggesting that in October 2023, Scotland would be going back to the polls in a second Scottish independence referendum. Now, that was a year ago. Look at where we are now. The SNP have tanked in the polls. They've tanked in this uh, by-election. Uh, they have had a change of leadership that has caused chaos at the top of the party. There is an argument internally and within senior ranks of the party around the strategy 
on that independence referendum. Some are saying it shouldn't happen for a great many years and the party should focus on their domestic record here in Scotland. So, you know, from going from, well, there's going to be a referendum in October 2023 this month, this time last year saying that, to the chaos that the party is seeing now and the electoral defeat, the massive electoral defeat of more than a 20% swing, that says it all about where the SNP is at the moment. They're still the largest party, yes, of course, because there hasn't been a Scottish election here. But the way that the figures are pointing, the projections that Michael has been talking about, Labour with more than 40 seats once again north of the border is, as Michael said, a game changer. And if that projection is right, with all the usual caution and caveats around it, six seats for the SNP is the projection, six seats for the Conservatives, the same number of seats. Again, given the context and the content, the political content of, of the last 10 years, 13 years here in Scotland, that was unthinkable even at the start of this year. Scottish politics, it's never boring, is it? Uh, Professor Michael Thrasher, <laughs> Conor Gillis, good to see you both. And that is your lot for this edition of the Sky News Daily. We'll be back again next week.